Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. Yes, it is afternoon at the time of recording this, Friday afternoon, and uh, it's good to be back. We're a few weeks out from Christmas, hopefully putting COVID-19 behind us. Unfortunately, that's not the way with the rest of the world, but um, we're in a pretty good spot. This is a time of year I particularly hate, and... um, I can't wait till it's over. I always count down to the 20th of February at this point. You know, over the decades, um, Christmas has become less and less about um, the death of Jesus of Nazareth or religion or worship and has become more and more about Father Christmas presents, um, overeating, getting drunk, self-indulgent, stripping shelves of as many pieces of throwaway rubbish as we can get our hands on and um, crowds push and shove, difficult to get anything, not the greatest time of year. A lot of businesses closed, so I'm delayed by months getting things done. So, yeah, it's not... uh, not a box of birds for everybody unfortunately this time of year so I just hope that people show each other a bit of kindness and consideration just show a little bit of thought this year you know now that we're getting this uh, pandemic behind us I don't want us to go back to the way it was I would be really 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 disappointed if we did I want to see something better. I want to see us come out of this better. I would like to think that we've had a bit of a chance for reflection of who we are and what we want because we have a lot of really difficult, serious problems to face now and in the immediate future because we're not in a particularly good state right now we're better than a lot of the rest of the world but when i see things like the poor old orchardists in the hawks bay and elsewhere struggling to get people um to pick the fruit i think well wow there's so many people out there wanting jobs i would really like to see um something coordinated where the information can get out there on the jobs available, the accommodation available, how long a job is for, um, you know, something a little bit more coordinated than just throwing money at the problem. This seems to be um, the way the government reacts out of expediency rather than planning. So there doesn't seem to be any action. There is only ever reaction. Once something has gone wrong and broken, then they try and fix it rather than seeing the problem we know there's going to be a problem and addressing that problem with a temporary fix for now but perhaps a more permanent one down the track there was a time when I was a lad where um we had seasonal work and people used to work at the abattoir or or, or, um the meat works for six months and then those of them who were really industrious would go fruit picking over the over the period that they could and it was a good life for some people a really good life unfortunately agriculture has always suffered from that stigma of being poor paying and i've done fruit picking myself it's hard work but it is fantastic work a great lifestyle young people parties lots of good times you play hard, but you work hard too, and you try and earn yourself a decent bit of coin. And what we need is a cultural shift where more young people see this as an option, not necessarily as a career, although some of them, they do find careers out of this. They find they like the work so much that there's off-season work to do, you know, pruning, um, doing posts, whatever. There's, There's lots and lots of work to do pretty much all year round, although it obviously hits a lull in the middle of winter. But, you know, there's thinning, there's pruning, there's all kinds of jobs that you can do outside just the fruit picking. So it is definitely an option and definitely a career and not just agriculture, but viticulture as well. Wine is absolutely boom, boom, booming at the moment. 
you may not be into it, but our Savion Blanc, I would argue, is absolutely up there with the world's best. And, you know, other other drops that we do, I think our Pinot Noir, especially from down south, is particularly good. Fantastic gear as far as I'm concerned. And I see a great future because this is a little gentler on the land, although I get sick to death of farmers getting a hard time and people going on and on and on and on and on about methane, which is really just a complete load of bullshit, because if you consider 500 years ago, 260 million, 260 million elephants lived in Africa. Now there are 815,000. So 259,200,000 have now disappeared, and they were consuming a tonne a tonne a day. So we are talking about 250 million tonnes a day. Boom, just like that. Billions and billions and billions of tonnes of methane, which is now no longer going into the atmosphere. And it's not just them, the wildebeest, the zebra, now represent less than 10%. So you take all of those animals out of the equation and they are the equivalent to over a billion cattle, in fact, closer to about 5 billion cattle, more than what there are in the world today. So it swings and roundabouts. What we've lost in nature, we've made up for in domestic. So really, it's not as bad as what people would make out. When you look at the big picture through a keyhole, you're never going to understand it all. You have to do research. You have to be balanced. And don't let slight and bias and prejudice and ignorance make people believers in something that isn't real. You know, you repeat the lie often enough and it becomes the truth and then everyone else is a denier when in fact they're far, far, far better informed and have done far more research. I've been researching this subject for 40 years. So this is not something that just happened along the way. Because I'm interested in things like archaeology, I am fascinated by what happened in the world over the millennia and indeed over millions of years and I've done a lot of research as to the causes. I've read chaos theory and I've read astronomy and I do all kinds of work all the time. I study this all of the time and what I hear from the media and what I see from my research are two completely different things. They are absolutely poles apart and it concerns me that you know, TV channels say we're bringing you the news that matters, but they're not bringing us any news whatsoever. You know, I turn over to Al Jazeera, and they're telling me what's happening in the world. They're telling me what's happening in the United States, in the West. They're telling me the COVID situation in each country in Europe, day by day, where we're at. They are telling me that Kevin Rudd and company are taking on Rupert Murdoch in order to try and break up his empire and no longer rule Australian politics. This has not even been mentioned, and I watch TV at 6 o'clock, I watch it early, I watch it during the day, I watch it late at night, and never has there been a mention. The share market, the price of oil, the price of gold, how our companies are doing, nothing is ever mentioned. What our GDP is, how much money we owe, none of it is known, ever, by any of us. We are completely kept in the dark. And all we have is titillation for the masses. Who murdered who? Who shot a dog? These are the headline news that we have, is all of this nasty, vicious, horrible shit that's going on at home, which really doesn't affect anybody very much other than to horrify us. But real news, what's really happening in the world, is brought to me by Muslims from Doha. Now, if I asked you where Doha was on the map, there's no way you were going to point it out to me. You wouldn't say to me, well, let me see now, that would be just south of Iran, just north of the United Arab Emirates, and just east of Saudi Arabia. That's where it is. It's in Qatar. Who on earth has ever been there, let alone knows what it looks like? And yet Doha is one of the most advanced cities in the world. It is gorgeous. It is rocketing ahead. It is incredibly rich. 
But don't you see the irony in it? The only real channel that I can get real news from. They're Muslims. They're not Westerners. English is not their first language, and yet these are the people giving me good information, even better than the Observer of the Sunday Times or even the Guardian, which used to be brilliant, but now is pandering towards money. Capitalism, unfortunately, has dominated the direction it's headed and directly affected the fantastic quality that it used to be. Now, my show was about mental health, and how does this all affect mental health? Well, you know, lack of information on things like the amount of sugar that we're consuming, and as a result, there's over a million adults in New Zealand suffering from obesity, one in every three adults. And this causes all kinds of mental problems down the track for people like that. Their life quality is not as good. And it is all being done by the people who are selling you bread and breakfast cereal and tins of beans and jam. Everything is chock-a-block full of sugar, far more than there should be. And as a result, we are becoming obese as a nation. And this is affecting mental health. The way we treat each other at Christmas time, some people... Oh, there's family violence, people commit suicide, people are terribly, terribly sad. So, you know, spare a thought for those who are not so well off. Do your bit for society, I plead you if you can. A bit of food to the food bank or just help someone out during this period of time. This is when we should be thinking about each other and not being self-indulgent and greedy and just going for the flashest, finest things that we can have and showing off to everybody else. I'd like to think that we could show a little bit of kindness in a time where there is an enormous amount of stress and problems for people. I would like to see the media tell us more news, real news about what's going on in the world so that we can be informed and outward looking rather than insular and inward looking because that's when problems happen. The more out in the open, the more honest people are about things, the better, fairer, kinder judgments we can make. I also hate the fact that we are being absolutely ripped off. I have seen the price of meat, and I don't know why the government can't see this, but I've watched lamb chops go from $18 to 33 I've watched ribeye steak go from $30 to 52 in two years. I've watched mints go from, 18, from $10 to $18, just like that. And this is food we used to give to the cats. Now it's becoming a luxury food. And more and more and more people are simply turning to takeaways, which of course we know are not good for us. Now I'm not saying don't eat them. I eat them. I'm going to eat one this afternoon. But I only eat one pizza a week and that is it. And it's either a pizza or a burger. Not both. I eat one takeaway meal a week. That's what I allow myself. And that's why I'm not a big fatty. I used to be. I used to be 120 kilos, I am now 85, and I didn't do any magic diet, I just stopped eating all the chocolate and ice cream and fatty, fatty, living on fatty foods, and boy, the weight just dropped off like you wouldn't believe, and now I hope I'm going to live to be a little bit longer and have a bit better health, it's encouraged me and helped with my mental health, I feel a little better, I feel a little fitter and it's given me the inspiration to go out there and look after myself a bit more. When you don't like your body shape, the way you look, you feel down about yourself, depression is far more likely to get on top of you. If you are exercising, walking, getting outside, getting fitter, getting healthier, getting in shape, looking better, you're going to have a more positive attitude towards yourself and therefore the rest of the world. So it's important that we think about things like that, looking after ourselves rather than overindulging. And this is what I'm hoping for in this new year. Well, it's not just about... um, talking about mental health issues or what's going on in the world, I also read my stories and I'm going to have to crack on with this one today. The reason I do this is to emphasise that just because you suffer severely from mental illness, from depression and bipolar and 
obsessive compulsive disorder, it doesn't mean that you can't live a life. You certainly can. And I'm always pushing myself to have adventures. And this is one of them. This is called To the End of the Road. The West Coast has always held a fascination for me. From the 90 to the fields of that spectacular side. The East has always been my favourite side, but the West has always calls and challenges you. So I knew I had to go there, down south, through the top gorge to Bullet, and out to the West Coast at the top. But I was to be delayed unexpectedly. At the time I was living in Pahiatua with my dog Diamond, me and Diamond Dog, I'd just finished doing up and selling a house in Wainui in Lower Hutt for a good profit, but ended up having a bit of a breakdown. I had then bought a ute, a computer, a huge trailer from my friend Keith and a few other bits and pieces. I then bought my shop and flat in Pahiatua and moved 17 trailer loads of junk in and taken on looking after Diamond Dog, a crazy mongrel that seemed to suit me well. I took to retraining a dog, already three years old, and reading maps, dreaming and planning. With the dog, I really got into the outdoors and came up with the idea of doing an extended camping holiday with the hounds. I kept coming back to the west coast on the map. I had not really been south of Westport on the road, and it soon became apparent the road was calling me. I compiled a huge and comprehensive list of all of the gear I would need, mostly fishing, diving, camping and cooking. Then I systematically packed all the gear in fish bins and packed them perfectly on the huge tough tray of the ute. On top of the bins I put my rods and reels and a single foam mattress, all covered and held down with a tawny cover, which is perfect. I wasted no time packing, knowing that everything I could possibly need. I had planned that part well. As for the journey itself, I had only planned to drive to Blenheim, then through Renwick, the Wairau, St Arnold, then left after Murchison, down the 65 to Springs Junction on the Lewis Pass, where I hoped to catch up with an old friend, Tar. I had a fantastic trip down, from 3am to the ferry from Wellington at 6, a great crossing through the sounds I fell in love with as a child. I stopped in Blenheim for lunch, in stores. The dog and I filled up with pies. It was great to retrace my steps through the vineyards to Renwick, then blast down the straight roads of the interior with the CD blasting out and the warm wind in my face. Past the north shore of Lake Rotuiti and the south side of Kaharangi National Park and left after Murchison down to Springs Junction on the Lewis Pass. It was late by the time I got to Springs Junction it was grey and dark and everything was shut and it was obvious I wouldn't be catching up with tar. So I unloaded the fish bins under the ute, brewed a coffee and crashed out with the dog on the back tray of the ute. The foam mattress was super comfortable and the tawny kept me dry and sleeping in my sleeping bag with my back to the dog kept me warm. The next day I headed up to Reefton and I was just so struck with the place. Many of the early buildings were still standing, real gems, and I spent the day enjoying coffees, walking the dog in the park, and exploring the town. As an old gold mining town, it was steeped in history and was the first town in New Zealand to have electricity. In the afternoon, I stumbled upon a strange old hardware store and struck up a conversation with the owner. The conversation turned to gold panning, and he told me he panned the Anungahua, which ran through town. He also told me of a spot just out of town called Slab Creek Hut where I could go gold panning and camp for a night or two. So I bought a really good pan from him and headed to the spot which was so beautiful I knew straight away I had to set up camp and pan for a while. On arriving at Slab Creek Hut I noticed a wide dirt track heading up the hill. It led to a flattened area out of sight where pine trees had been cut and loaded many years ago. The flat site had become overgrown with broom and I found a protected flat site amongst the broom perfect for camping, well hidden away. 
I set up a perfect campsite, hidden up there with the tarp on the ground, then the tent and a tarp over the tent tied to the broom, providing a waterproof cover and protected area on the outside of the camp for a lounge and kitchen. Wicker had spread throughout the undergrowth and Diamond Dog had great fun chasing them through their tunnels, but happily never managed to catch any of them. I made a wonderful fire that night and drifted off to sleep serenaded by the wecker and the moorpork. Over the next few weeks I done, donned my wetsuit every day and headed up the creek to a large boulder I thought might bear some gold. Every day I dug my way down into the riverbed panning as I went. Diamond Dog sat on the track some 20 metres away like a sentinel, patient and unmoving. I was worried she would attack passing strangers but was rapt when I saw her let them pass without aggression. Being a pit bull cross, pretty solid and intimidating with a bit of an aggressive mental streak, I had to watch her closely to avoid her harming anyone stupid enough to challenge me or her. She was so well behaved and we've spent some of the happiest days of my life panning for gold and camping in the bush. After a few days camping, I decided to head back to town in the evening for a beer. The dog watched the ute while I had a couple of pints and won 500 bucks on the pokies. Thanks to that wonderful win, I had a steak dinner at the pub every night, a few pints and a half a dozen beers to take back to the camp, even a little bit of steak for the dog. It was just paradise. Unfortunately, dogs were not allowed in the campgrounds, so the dog and I had to live at the creek which in many ways was better. I also spent a bit of time driving around Reefton, photographing its wonderful buildings, places of history, the river and the railway station and so on. After a wonderful week in Reefton, I headed off with a few flakes of gold and memories I will never forget. I headed back up Highway 69 to Anangahua, then followed the bullet to the turn-off just before Westport and out to the coast at Charleston. I blasted down the coast at quite illegal speeds, past Punakaiki with the CD whamming out full bore. I got to the Grey River, and the sky turned dark, and I realised what an appropriate name Greymouth has. I stopped at Greymouth for lunch, and unfortunately my dog bit some idiot who came too close while we were eating. I loved to share my burgers with the dog, but I never gave the creature too much. I checked out the map at Greymouth and decided to head down the coast to Hokitika and Rost and inland on Highway 6 and back out to the coast of the place called Okarito Lagoon. It was an inspired choice. There was a very basic campsite at Okarito, just campsites in the fireplace, but to its credit it had a kitchen, a dining room, toilet and showers. It really was perfect. I walked Diamond Dog down the beach every day for hours and hours and hours and we caught rig and collected firewood. The rig, which is a very nice type of eating shark, were large and plentiful. The dog and I had all the fish we could eat, and the greedy hound could eat to her heart's content. At night I would light big fires and get on the piss and have a bit of a smoke with the foreigners, touring the beautiful south. I remember a young English couple were particularly fun and I think they will remember our nights together as the best of their New Zealand holiday. I spent a wonderful week at Okarito beneath the magnificent Southern Alps. It really just moved my soul. Franz Joseph was just down the road so I stopped there for lunch to visit the glacier. I was amazed how busy the town was with choppers constantly flying rich visitors to Fox Glacier. I drove up to find Franz Joseph and was very happy to be greeted by some mountain Kia, but was shocked at just how far the glacier has receded. From Franz Joseph I followed the highway down to Haast, the last turn of insignificance on the west coast. I stopped at the Flash pub for a beer and a feed, resupplied and blasted down the road to Hannah's Green as the trees created the most credible green tunnel as I neared the end of the road. From there through Neils Beach to Patterson Inlet, where the road finishes. As it turned out, no one lived there. There was only unoccupied buildings belonging to fishing companies, a wharf and a few commercial boats anchored in the small bay. Some clever buggers had set up a mobile fish and chip shop there, 
So the dog and I had a good feed when we headed back to the last point of habitation, Neil's Beach. I stayed at Neil's Beach for a week and struck up a friendship with the fisherman there who ran the accommodation. I didn't do any white baiting because it was out of season, but Diamond and I had a wonderful time there, eating crayfish and walking on the beaches and catching rig. It was a wonderful time we had there, and uh, the rivers were especially beautiful. I remember walking and camping along them and listening to the birds, and it was just amazing how wet the place was and how much life there was. The Arafata River was particularly beautiful, with a magnificent blue colour, and I knew I had to go back there to white bait at some stage. I haven't been back down there since, but the road is always calling me, and I think at some point I really have to get back there before the legs give out. Diamond Dog has long since left me, the bugger was shot so many years ago. I miss her now, and I know I have to get another dog and get down there and give it one more crack on the white baiting before they make it illegal. I guess this is a place that will be in my heart forever and I can't wait for the next trip down. The end. Well that's me for another week. It really was a magnificent spot and I love the south and I would encourage people to get away now that we've got this pandemic. A lot more people are looking around New Zealand and rediscovering what a magnificent place it is. Honestly, you could spend an entire lifetime from the fantastic far north all the way down to the Catlins, Invergill and Stewart Island. Stewart Island is like booked out for months now. You're not going to get a place down there, but you, you shouldn't miss it out. No way, no way. You've got to get down there if you have a chance. And, you know, see places like the Catlins. Get out on the Milford, the Hollyford. Yes, you do have to book well in advance, especially if you're going to do something like the Milford track. But, boy, is it ever worth it. You know, it truly, truly moves your soul. It is so beautiful, so magnificent down there that if you've never been, you truly are missing out. And... They could always do with your money. You know, it's very, very important that we support small businesses now more than ever. So many are going to struggle. So don't worry too much about the never-never. Think about the here and now. Supporting small restaurants, not big chains, little businesses, little coffee shops, the dairies. Everybody needs our help now, and it's time for us to come together as a community as a country and support each other and get through these tough times because this is normal okay things like this happen all of the time if you look throughout history the last century was fraught with struggle and trouble and coming together is the only way to solve these problems so this is why i do what i do for free i don't get paid for this in fact it costs me money to do this show but Arrow is a not-for-profit organisation that supports the community and Michael and Veronica here are ever so kind, allowing me to do this show for free. It costs them as well. This show's supposed to be sponsored but never has been because they're kind and considerate and they think that it's worth it. So, you know, we have some wonderful sponsors, New Zealand On Air and a whole lot of other trusts that support us. Wairapa TV's got involved. Thank you very much for that. It's a great organisation to be part of and to work for, and I am very grateful to be allowed a voice. So, you know, thanks to Arrow Radio, and thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed. Um, my thoughts go out especially to the wonderful people of the Wairapa and the Hawke's Bay who tune into my show. Thank you all very much, and I hope you enjoy and spread the good word, and I'll see you again once or twice before Christmas. So take it easy out there and think about each other a bit more. Thanks, and goodbye.